As far as possible, I invite you, I invite you to kneel with me as we come before God's throne. Loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for life this morning. And as we pause a moment longer to understand truth, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would rain down upon us. Please help us to see spiritually what you need to say to us individually. Guide us, I pray. May your words fill my lips. May the hearts of your people be touched and may it lead to the enlarging of your kingdom in Jesus name we pray amen I invite you to turn with me into 2 Timothy chapter 3 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, we're going to see some interesting parallels today between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. Some very interesting parallels the Lord is going to show us as we search the scriptures. Notice what the Bible says in light of persecution in these last days. We are in... Second Timothy three and verse 12. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in second Timothy three and verse 12, it says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So what did it say? Those who do what? Those who live godly. Those who do what is right, those who live a righteous life, the Bible says that they will suffer persecution. That's what the Bible says. Hmm. Now, when you consider persecution, a lot of times people don't associate false charges with persecution, but the two are connected. And we're going to see that as we compare some scriptures today. Notice what the Bible says. In the very next verse, in light of falsehood, deception is mentioned. It mentions in verse 13 of 2 Timothy 3, it says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being what? Deceived. So notice that those who live righteous, what's going to happen to them? Pers they're going to suffer persecution. It says all shall. It doesn't say might. That means anybody who lives doing what is right, what's going to happen? They're going to suffer persecution. Not might. So some of you, both near, that are here present, and far, that are watching online, are going through trials, and you're dealing with enemies. And as you deal with your enemies... God is allowing you to be persecuted. Why? Because he's perfecting your character and teaching you how to love your enemies. It's not a fun experience always, though. It's not an enjoyable one but it's one that is necessary for the perfection of your character because it is only character that you are taking to heaven. You can't take that car, those clothes, that nice house, your jewelry, that bank account. None of that can go with you to heaven. The only thing you can take is character. Therefore, God needs you to have the character of Christ here on earth through this born-again experience that once you do enter heaven, you possess Christ fully. Not partially, but fully. 
Yet at the same time, those who live godly will suffer persecution. At the same time, evil men, the Bible says, will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Quite a contrast, huh? Quite a contrast. Now I'm going to show you this connection between persecution and false charges. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And verse 11. Matthew 5. Verse 11. The Bible says. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So does the Bible says that you're cursed or you're blessed? Blessed. When you're going through persecution, does it feel like you're blessed? Doesn't feel like it, huh? But the Bible says, God says, you are blessed when men shall revile you. What does the word revile mean? What does that mean? It says to criticize in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. That's what it says according to the definition in the dictionary. To criticize in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. When somebody insults you, they call you outside of your name. They call you something other than what you truly are. You're a man, they call you a woman. You're a woman, they call you a man. It's an insult, right? They're insulting you. The Bible says, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So they are saying false things about you, things that are not true. They are lying on you. God says you're blessed. Why do you think God allows that to happen? That's right, to test you. That's right. Also, God is perfecting your character. And God is teaching us to love our enemies. All right? To love them, not hate them. And that is not easy. That requires prayer. That requires consecration. That requires a heart that is surrendered to God. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, it's testing your patience. So, there's a purpose in God allowing you to be persecuted. You may have enemies that you're dealing with. And God is trying to teach you how to love your enemies. God taught David how to love Saul even though Saul was trying to kill him. You see that? And some of you have some Saul's in your life. They may not be literally trying to kill you, but they are oppressing you. They're doing things toward you that are wrong. And God is teaching you how to love your enemies. Does God, did Christ love his enemies? So then we have to be like Christ, right? You know, God wants us to be like him. So therefore, you have to go through what Christ went through. Um, it is, there were individuals who were present that crucified Christ, not literally putting the nails in his hands, but 
that were present and crying crucify him that eventually their hearts were turned after he died and ended up serving Christ. Only God knows. Only God knows. But as long as we confess our sin, there's hope. As long as we make things right with God and our fellow man, there's hope. So we will find out whether the man that pierced Christ in his side, whether he's in heaven, we'll find out if we are faithful. We'll find out in due time. Notice what the Bible says as we, matter of fact, no, I want to still come back to this word revile. In, in the bottom, we have some, some words that are similar to revile or that are synonyms of the word revile. It says here to criticize, to censure, to condemn, or to attack. You know, today's, today's day and age, the word attack, often I see it used incorrectly. You know, somebody rebukes someone else publicly for a public sin, and they say, oh, you're attacking that person. No, you're not attacking. You're rebuking sin. Just like Jesus in Matthew 23 rebuked public sin of the scribes and Pharisees. So there's a difference between rebuking sin and attacking someone. You're, you see what I mean? There's a, there's a difference. And when you talk about revile, notice that the definition that we read said in an insulting manner, right? In an insulting manner. There's a difference between rebuking sin and insulting someone. There's a difference. And I see some revilers that call themselves pastors. They insult people that sincerely want a question to their answer, an answer to their question, but they insult them. You know, in a kind of intelligent kind of way, they insult them. And it shows that the heart of the insulter or the one who's giving the insult is not cleansed. It shows that they are not under the control of Christ, but actually under the control of Satan. Now, imagine if God were to bring judgment on a minister that a person has been following for years or months, and you've been following this man, and God brings judgment on this man. Here you thought you were following a man of God, and God brings judgment on him. What does that say for the discernment of the person who's been following that false minister? It means that they've been following a snake all along and they didn't know it. It shows that they're not truly connected with Christ. That's what it shows. And we're going to see that happen in the church. Many people that were following a man are going to realize that man receives the judgment of God and, and then it's gonna be revealed you were following this man, yet this man was outside of Christ, and you didn't even realize it. You didn't even know it. It's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing. This is why we must know Christ for ourselves. We must have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. Seriously. We must learn to take time to pray to read and study our Bibles for ourselves. Because what many are teaching is heresy today. You have ministers teaching people how to sin. Heresy is false teaching that is contrary to Christ. Contrary to the spirit of unity. Contrary to the spirit of love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith is teaching that begets disunity, disunion, division. It causes division. So we just read Matthew 5.11 that said that there is a blessing when somebody says false things about you. 
So you see the connection between persecution and false charges? You've seen it, right? Notice what we are to do in verse 12. It gives us instruction actually what we are to do. Verse 12 says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So what are we to do? Rejoice. Rejoice and be glad. Why? Because if they, prof if they persecuted Jeremiah, if they persecuted Moses, if they persecuted Joseph, if they persecuted Isaiah, then that means you're doing something right. Amen? That's what the Lord is showing us. Let's go to another passage. Turn with me to Luke 6. Turn with me to Luke 6. And I want you to just turn to Luke 6. I'm not going to give you the verse yet because I want to talk to you for a second. I want to talk to you. I want to stimulate your spiritual mind. We'll read it in a second. If false charges is one of the ways that God allows persecution to come to his people, then should we believe everything we hear about somebody? No. Should we believe every report that comes about somebody? No. That, that's, that's very clear, right? If there's false charges coming against the righteous, then that means we have to learn to ignore certain reports. We have to learn to ignore certain things that are being said about somebody who's doing righteous things. There was a false report about Joseph that he tried to rape Potiphar's wife. Now, I want you to think about this. Here's a man who refused to have fornication with Potiphar's wife, who refused to commit adultery, and she said, he tried to touch me, he tried to grab me, he tried to take me and have me. Now he's being charged with what? Rape. So what happens to his reputation? Destroyed, right? Reputation totally destroyed, slandered. What's that now? Yeah, he did, he did not. Potiphar knew that Joseph didn't do that. But to save face, you see, many times political leaders do things to save face. You know? To save face means so that his wife doesn't look like a liar. You see? So for the sake of his wife's reputation and so that his household looks like they have it together, we're going to sacrifice Joseph's reputation for the sake of his wife's. You see? Saving face. And therefore, Joseph is now charged with rape. But did he commit rape? So I'm sure there were rumors that Joseph's a rapist, right? There was gossip going around that Joseph was what? A rapist. But was he really a rapist? No. So that's to give you an example, one example. The other point I wanted to touch is false charges can be brought against anybody, whether some, a public figure, whether a church member. And we have to be careful what we believe in the news. You have to be careful because everything they tell you on the news isn't true. You know that, right? I hope you understand. Everything they tell you on the news is not true. One day, you may see me on the news and there's some false report. I have a friend right now in the federal penitentiary, and there he was on the front page of the local paper here, and it was lies. It was not true. 
But two men lied on him so that they could get a shorter sentence. And therefore, those things were reported in the newspaper on the front page of the Virginia Pilot, the local newspaper here. Now he's in the federal penitentiary serving a sentence for a crime that he didn't commit. We'll we'll leave that for another we'll leave that yeah, we'll leave that for another day. But I'm saying these things because as believers we have to have discernment. And many Christians are gullible. They believe everything that they hear. They believe the news. They believe this gossip, this slander. They believe it too easily, not having discernment to understand, man, if this person is really doing something righteous, there's going to be false reports about them. You see? There were false reports about Jesus. We'll get there. Turn with me to Luke 6. Luke 6 and verse 26. Notice what the Bible says. Luke 6 and verse 26 Notice what the Bible says. Woe unto you. I still see pages turning. Luke 6 and verse 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. So if everybody is speaking well of you, what does that mean? You're a false prophet. You see, in today's society, they want you to be politically correct. They want you to not offend certain groups. You know, don't offend, don't offend the LGBT group. Don't offend the abortion rights group. Right? They want you to be politically correct. You can't call LGBT sin. You can't call abortion sin which they both are sin, right? Just as well as fornication and lying and coveting. We live in a day and age where in order to, you know, move up in society, you have to, you know, not step on people's toes, so to speak. And this, by not stepping on people's toes, this is what allows all men to speak well of you. You see? But the Bible says you're a false prophet if all men speak well of you. So that means if somebody is saying something bad about you, then you must be doing something right. Make sense? You must be doing something right. Verse 27. But I say unto you, which here love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, Ask them not again. Now let's pause. So does that mean if I'm getting off the highway, off the ramp, and I see a homeless person with a sign saying, you know, hungry, you know, help please, does that mean I, I'm required to give him a dollar? No, that's not what that means. Because many of the people standing with a sign asking for money, most of them are taking that money to use on a habit, whether it be drugs, whether it be cigarettes, whether it be alcohol. God has not called Christians to help fund somebody's habit. That's not what you're called to do. That's not what you're called to do. So that is not referring to that. What this is more so referring to is when you're dealing with someone, let's say a brother, in the faith. And, you know, you see that they are taking advantage of you and they're getting the better end of the business deal in a divorce. 
Let it be. They they want, you know, the dog and you know the 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 second house. Let it be. God what God is saying is even as you see somebody taking advantage of you, sometimes you got to let it happen. Why? Because in due time, we all reap what we sow. In life, you know, I talk to some of the, some some guy, people on the street, and they say karma. You know, they use the word karma, where what goes around comes around. You get what you give. And this is true about life because that principle is found in the word of God. I don't use the term karma because it's connected to other things that I don't believe. But when we understand reaping and sowing in life, what you sow is what you will reap. That's true about life. If you steal from others, somebody is going to come and steal from you. Right? You know, this is true about life. So this is something that many that engage in stealing or engage in taking advantage of others have not realized. They have not realized and learned to understand that you do reap what you sow in life. So we have to be careful of how we treat others. This is where the principle of loving your neighbor as your self should be exercised, should be lived. Notice what the Bible says in verse 31. It says, and as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. Pause. In other words, God says, hey, you're not going to get a reward for loving somebody that loves you. That's easy, right? What's not easy is loving somebody that hates you. That's not easy to do. That requires supernatural power. That requires the love of God to be given to you to give that love to that person that doesn't deserve it. Because that is what God does for us all the time. Do we deserve the love of God? No. No, we don't. And as we understand the unconditional love that God has for us, and we receive of that love and experience that love, then we can give that love to somebody else. That love must come from God. It's not something that you're born with. It's not something that you can manufacture. It's something that God must give you. And then as you possess that love, you can give it to somebody else. That's your enemy. Let's keep reading. Verse 33. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing again and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the who? Evil or selfish. So God is kind to the unthankful and to who? The evil. So people that don't thank God, does God provide for them? Yes, he does. The Bible says his reign is for the just and the unjust. They benefit from the rain just like we do. They benefit from the sun just like we do. God's love is unconditional. And only as we understand the love of the gospel and receive of that love, can you then in turn give that love to your enemies. Notice Jesus' example in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 19. 
We're talking about practical godliness. We're talking about living the gospel. If we don't understand the principles of the gospel in our daily lives, then we haven't fully understood the gospel. 1 Peter 2, beginning at verse 19, notice what the Bible says. 1 Peter 2 and verse 19, it says, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Suffering how? In other words, he didn't do anything wrong but he's suffering on account of those who are his enemies. You see, who have wronged him. Notice what it goes on to say. For what glory is it, if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. So we should follow whose steps? Christ's steps. Let's keep reading. It says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. What is guile? Guile is deception. Guile is falsehood. It's deceit. It's craft. It's manipulation of the facts. That's what God is. Verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So what did Jesus do when he was reviled? Did he respond and revile? Did he respond to an insult with an insult? No, no, he didn't. He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. In other words, he committed himself to God. And this is what we must do when we are reviled or we are treated wrong or we are suffering persecution. We have to commit ourselves to God who judgeth righteously. Does not God judge righteously? And sometimes... Individuals are looking for God to judge their enemies, and God is saying, pray for your enemies. Pray that their hearts repent. Pray that they turn. Pray that they are converted. That's what the Lord is saying. Not pray that they are judged and condemned and lost. No. Pray that they be saved. Pray that they change their ways before it's too late. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. And let us begin in verse 59. Notice what happened before Jesus went to the cross. Notice what the church leaders were involved with regarding false charges against Christ. It says in Matthew 26 and verse 59, says, Now the chief priest and elders and all the council sought false, excuse me, sought false witness against Jesus to put him to what? So what were the church leaders looking for? What were the church leaders looking for? A false witness. That's what they were looking for. It says, and all the council sought, that word sought means they were looking, looking for, sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Can you imagine? You're looking for false witnesses. So if the false, if the leaders, if the, now consider this, this is the church leaders in Christ's day. If the church leaders in Christ's day were looking for a false witness, then what will the church leaders in our day do as we approach the second coming? 
This is what was happening at the first coming of Christ. The church leaders were looking for a false witness. Then what will the church leaders do in our day? At the second coming of Christ, they will look for false witnesses. You see how evil that is? You see how corrupt that is? That which hath been is that which shall be. So if the church leaders at the first coming of Jesus were looking for false witnesses, that means the church leaders in our day are going to be looking for false witnesses. That's serious. That shows how corrupt and evil their hearts are not pure. Let's keep reading. Verse 60, it says, but found none. I'm in Matthew 26 and verse 60. It says, but found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. How many? Two false witnesses. So did they finally find what they were looking for? You search for something long enough, will you find it? Yeah. Yeah. Whether good or bad. Yeah. So that means that there's going to be false witnesses against God's children. Please don't miss these points. There are going to be false witnesses against God's children in these last days. If it happened at the first coming of Jesus, then we must expect it to happen as we approach the second coming of Jesus. There will be false witnesses. Let's keep reading. Verse 61. And said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What it? What is it which these witness against thee? Now let's pause. Notice how they twisted Jesus' words. They said, Jesus said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Did he really say that? He did say that. But they twisted his words. Jesus was referring to the temple of his body, not the building of the sanctuary. You see, not the literal church building as they applied it. He was referring to the temple of his body because the temple of your body is the whole, should be belong to God, right? It's the temple of God, right? So he was using that illustration, that analogy, that metaphor to convey an understanding that he would die and then resurrect three days later. That's what he said in John 2. That's where that statement is found concerning Jesus saying, I will destroy this body and build it in three days. You find that in John chapter 2. So lying doesn't just mean just a blatant lie. Lying also consists of manipulating facts. You see? That's also lying. Mis skewing information. You see? Do we see information skewed today? On the news? By ministers? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. False witnesses. A lie is to manipulate the facts. Manipulate the truth. Just a little bit, turning a little bit of the information. It's a lie. It's a lie. God is looking for children who have integrity, who will be completely transparent and open and honest about the facts. That's what God needs. Not somebody who's going to manipulate the information. And there's a lot of manipulation going on. A lot of manipulation going on. Let's keep reading. Another point I wanted to point out Matter of fact, we need to write these points on the board. We need to write these points on the board. This is what happened at the first coming of Jesus. 
so we can understand what will happen at the second coming. At the first coming, what did you have? False witnesses. False witnesses. And Jesus was condemned based upon those false witnesses. What else did we have? We had another point that led to Jesus dying on the cross was you had church and state united. Church and state unity. Church and state uniting, church and state union is what took place at the first coming. Remember the scribes and Pharisees, they took Jesus to who? Herod and, Pil Herod and Pilate, right? That's who they took Jesus to. And that's how eventually he was what? Condemned, right? Condemned to death. Crucify him, crucify him is what the crowd called for. Notice the next chapter. Let's go to Matthew 27. And notice what it says in verse 44 and 45. Matthew 27, verse 44 and 45. So notice, first you have the false witnesses, then you have the union of church and state, then you have a dark day. You have a dark day. Notice what it says in verse 44 and 45 of Matthew 27. It says, The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sambachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is going to be the cry of the church after the dark day. We're going to feel as though Christ or God has forsaken us. That's how the church is going to feel. So notice the, the order of events. First, you have false witnesses. This has currently been playing out and will continue to play out in the church right now. And even when I say in the church, I'm even talking about those who profess to believe present truth. False witnesses have already sprung up and have been making false accusations. Then you have what? Church and state uniting. In our day, what will be the result of church and state uniting? What will be the result of church and state uniting in our day? The result of church and state uniting will be the National Sunday Law. That's going to be the result of church and state uniting. Now, we've studied already in the past, in previous studies, that on the day when Sunday is signed into law, what are you going to have? A dark day. The day will go dark on that day. And it will be God's judgment manifesting because the law of the land has legislated for Sunday, the day of the sun, to be honored, which is a slap in the face to God. It is a a disrespect to God because God has commanded that the seventh day, Friday from Friday sundown until Saturday sundown, that's truly the Lord's day, not Sunday. And so God, as an act of judgment, to condemn what the church and state union have done in honoring Sunday, God is going to cause the day to go dark, saying you're walking in darkness, not light, because my light is the Sabbath. That's why... God is going to allow the day to go dark. Now, what else will happen on that day? Well, let's see what happened when the day went dark in Christ's day. Let's come over to verse 50 and read to 51. Notice what it says. It says, Jesus 
when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. So did you have natural disasters once Christ died? You have natural disasters. An earthquake is a natural disaster, right? Yes, it is. Have we talked about an earthquake happening on the dark day? Yes, we have. So you're seeing events from the first coming of Jesus that are clearly being brought out here in the scriptures. And these are the same events that are going to play out at the second coming of Jesus at the time of the mark of the beast when the national Sunday law is enforced. The day will go dark and we will see natural disasters such as an earthquake. We've also talked about the tsunami that will strike the Tampa Bay area in Florida. Now, some may say, well, how do you come to that conclusion? When you look at Amos 8, verse 8 through 10, you see that on the day that the day goes dark, there's also destruction by water. Amos 5, 8, Amos 8, 8 through 10, make it clear. Amos 5, 8, Amos 8, 8 through 10. There will be a destruction by water on the same day that the day goes dark. And God has revealed through dreams that that area will be the Tampa Bay area in Florida. Now, what other natural disasters will happen? We mentioned the tsunami. What else? An asteroid will strike the vicinity of America. An asteroid will strike the vicinity of America. And God allowing these natural disasters to strike, just as he used natural disasters to judge Pharaoh when he wouldn't let the people of God go, likewise, it's going to be a judgment from God because of the legislating of Sunday not allowing his children to worship the true Sabbath, to worship on the true Sabbath, not worship the Sabbath, but worship on the Sabbath. Judgment from God. God speaks through nature. You know that, right? Did you know that? God speaks through nature. We see that in the days of Pharaoh. And we also see it in other periods through history. God even spoke when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, three ministers, rose up against Moses, God's messenger. God allowed the ground to open up and those men were swallowed by the ground. Is that a natural disaster? Yes, it is. God judges often through natural disasters. When Joshua was at war, I believe with the Midianites, during that war in Joshua 10, or maybe it was the Amalekites, but I know Joshua was at war, and when he was at war, you'll find that the sun stood still, and on that day, there were hailstones that came down and fell on their enemies. Hailstones, is that a natural disaster? Yes, it is. God will allow natural disasters to come on the enemies of God's children. Isn't that what the seven last plagues are about? natural disasters that come upon those that are looking to destroy God's commandment keeping people. So we're seeing how events parallel from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming of Jesus. That's what the Lord is showing us. Now, as we talked about darkness and the coming dark day, did you know that there was darkness over in Taiwan just recently? Yeah. They just experienced 
a blackout. But before we address that, let's deal with this other article that shows that the separation of church and state is over. The separation of church and state is over in America. Notice this article. It says, separation of church and state? Let's get real. That's over. So what do we do now? It says, Jefferson's wall of separation is history. Is what? History. That's true. When we look at the fact that now churches are being funded by government taxpaying dollars, that when we look at the fact that um, you have pastor's salaries being paid by taxpayer money, that Christian schools are receiving government funds, church and state are fully united. That's what that shows. They're fully united. So church and state is over. That means the Sunday law is about to be enforced. That's what that means. Notice another article. Let's come over here to Taiwan. It says Taiwan hit by widespread power outages. Widespread what? Power outages. Two biggest cities and iPhone processor production hub affected. So there were power outages in Taiwan. Five million people affected. Massive blackout hits Taiwan, affecting five million households. Are you prepared for a blackout if one were to happen here in America? We should be prepared, brothers and sisters. The lights can go out at any minute. The power can go out at any minute. Have your batteries, your flashlights, uh, non-perishable food. Have these things ready so that when the blackout happens, not if, but when it does happen, you're prepared. Amen? You're prepared for the emergency. It's going to happen in due time. When? Only God knows. But we have a blackout coming as well. Now, here we have the Ukraine Orthodox leader. He is likening Vladimir Putin, the leader of Russia, to the Antichrist. He's calling Putin the Antichrist. Hmm. The Ukraine Orthodox church leader. He's calling Putin or likening Putin to the Antichrist. It says, this, this is him quoting now, this is him speaking. Notice what he says. The spirit of the Antichrist operates in the leader of Russia, the signs of which the scriptures reveal to us pride, devotion to evil, ruthlessness, false religiosity, he said according to an automated translation of his statement. He said this was Hitler during World War II. This is what Putin has become today. Now, I didn't say that. I'm just reading to you what he said. Now, we know who the Antichrist is. Vladimir Putin is not the Antichrist. The Antichrist is referring to the Catholic Church, the papacy, the Vatican. That is the mother of all harlots and abominations of the earth. That is the hub of lies that the world are being made drunk with as they drink the wine of Babylon. All the Protestant reformers all agreed that it was the Catholic Church that is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. All the Protestant reformers agreed upon that point. Not some, but all. Another article confirming. It says, Ukraine Archbishop slams Russian invasion, calls Putin the Antichrist. Statements underline religious conflict between the Orthodox churches in Russia and Ukraine. So, Antichrist, meaning against Christ or in the place of Christ. Well, who has called themselves God? The Pope. Many of the Catholic Church refer to themselves as God. Even the title on the hat says the vicar 
of the Son of God, meaning you are Christ on earth. That's a lie. That's heresy. They're not Christ on earth. This is blasphemy. And this is why God exposes the Catholic Church in his word. Not because he wants to lambast or wants to revile them, but he has sincere children that are in the Catholic Church, and he says, come out of her, my people. Come out of the Catholic ways of living. Honoring Sunday is a Catholic way of living. Honoring the Sabbath, Friday night sundown until Saturday night sundown, is God's way of living. It's Christ's way of living. And God is calling his children out of the Babylonian way of life, is what the Lord is doing. And when Sunday is exalted in America as the day of rest, we will see these natural disasters happen as a result of church and state uniting, God will speak. God will speak through the elements, through the natural disasters. My prayer, brothers and sisters, is that we will have the faith to live by every word of God now as we prepare for the time of crisis that is just ahead of us. We are so close to the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We are so close to the passing of the National Sunday Law, and many of God's people are fast asleep. Now's the time to take time to pray. Now's the time to turn the television off, to turn Netflix off, to turn Hulu off, to turn the cable off, and totally surrender our lives to Christ and indulge and engulf ourselves in God's word. Now's that time. Now's that time. Not next year. Not next month. Now. How many of you are ready to make such a commitment to Christ? How many of you are ready to totally surrender your life to Christ? That opportunity is now. We're not promised tomorrow. None of us are promised tomorrow. But we are promised today while we have breath in our lungs. Amen? Let us surrender ourselves. Let us make do of the time in which we've been given to totally give everything that we have and own to Christ. To totally surrender to him. These events will soon transpire and they will confirm the validity of the truth of the third angel's message concerning the warning of the beast, the image, and the mark. As we close, what have the Catholics been saying for many years in the Catholic record? Sunday is our mark of authority. The Catholic Church is above the Bible, and this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Sunday is the mark of the authority of the Catholic Church, not Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let us not follow Rome. Let us not follow the papacy. Let us not follow the Pope. Let us not follow the Catholic Catechism. But let us follow the Word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. And we thank you for even the honor to be able to be persecuted. Help us to understand that the righteous are those who are persecuted. The righteous have false reports about them. Help us to spiritually discern and understand these things, I pray. Lord, we thank you for answering this prayer. Now please, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I don't want my words to be misconstrued, and so by no means am I saying that Vladimir Putin is being persecuted. I don't want anybody to think that that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. I simply am bringing to you current events that are happening, meanwhile also teaching the principles of God's word. May God bless you and keep you. Take care.